Good afternoon, everybody. It's Phil Riley, who's uh, in charge of the introduction and the Q&A session. One of the things that I don't see on that uh, page is the fact that Robin is involved with the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, uh, which is based in Maine. And with my background in ecology and water, uh, whatnot, I was researching speakers on the importance of oceans to our world ecosystems, and I landed on Bigelow's website. I was amazed at the number of researchers connected with this not-for-profit enterprise. Robin Sleeth is one of about 100 researchers delving into the health and functioning of oceans. Robin has been focused on the ways algae impact our and ocean's health for many years. That focus has been on harmful algae blooms. Early work included algae blooms in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River systems, and most recently in the uh, eastern states where he's now located. And I'm not going to do any more introductions, so over to you, Robin. All right. Thank you, uh, folks, for, for inviting me and excited to share some of the research that I've been working on the past couple of years. So what I'm going to be talking about today um, is work under this main eDNA project. So I'll give a little bit of background on main eDNA, eDNA in general, and then share uh, a few sort of research highlights from the past couple of years. So um, main eDNA is a uh, National Science Foundation, so that's the United States uh, Science Funding Agency, um, EPSCoR Research Infrastructure Grant. And so EPSCoR is a really neat program that is targeting states that typically do not receive um, as much research funding. So there are a small fraction of states, and you can probably guess which ones, New York and California and things like that, that receive the vast majority of NSF dollars. And so this EPSCoR program is an effort to kind of spread the love um, and get some of that NSF money out to states that may historically and even currently uh, not have as much of that funding. And so um, this program is looking at environmental DNA uh, as a way to understand the health and functioning of coastal ecosystems. And as you can imagine, a place like Maine is, you know, the identity of this state is so closely tied with the Gulf of Maine and coastal ecosystems. Um, and also, I would say freshwater ecosystems as well. There are just as many people who come to Maine to go to the lakes and ponds um, up in the northern parts of the state uh, as do go, you know, not, I guess there are a few more people who are probably headed to Acadia National Park, uh, but nevertheless, many, many reasons to visit Maine and all of those uh, tend to focus on the natural beauty or kind of this history of working with coastal communities. So, what is environmental DNA and why do we think environmental DNA is going to be a useful way to look at Maine's coast uh, and understand how changes on that coast are occurring and perhaps forecast some useful information so that we can uh, improve livelihoods and better understand our changing world. So environmental DNA is genetic material that's obtained from an environmental sample. So as opposed to going out and collecting a fish and then taking a piece of fish fin, which is typically what is done, um, and then identifying something about that fish based on a DNA extract from the fin, for eDNA, you would just be going out and collecting a water sample. And typically what you then do is you filter that water sample onto a filter that has very, very small pores that are so small that basically everything except viruses and water are going to get trapped on that filter. So that means that you're getting fish cells 
or fish waste trapped on that filter. That means you're getting whole microorganisms like this cladocerin uh, trapped on that filter, and you're getting all of the microalgae uh, and even evidence of either land plants or aquatic plants. All of that, basically the entire ecosystem in a way we have learned you can, you can capture just from environmental sample. And this is because all organisms, all living organisms have DNA and almost all living organisms also are either continually dying, which then is allowing those dead um, or dying cells to get trapped or shedding cells like a fish might shed cells, um, or they're just small enough that the entire organism itself is gonna get trapped on that filter. Um, and so we can get eDNA from water samples. That's primarily what I'll be talking about today, but we can also get eDNA from soil and even from air. And we can use that um, DNA sample to characterize the whole community. So to understand everything in that water body, um, or we can do a more targeted approach if we want to know exactly how much of a certain thing is in the water. So if I wanna say, well, exactly how many trout are uh, in this stream at this given point when we're thinking about the impact of a dam, you could do a very targeted quantification of just that trout, as opposed to understanding what are all the organisms or a vast sort of chunk of the organisms in, in a certain water body. Um, and so eDNA has uh, been featured in the news fairly recently, as recently as just last week. There was this article in the New York Times that's approaching it from more of a, a data privacy angle um, where they there have been studies that have shown that from air collected in an office setting, this was an experiment, they didn't just go and do this, um, air collected from an office setting over a course of maybe a few hours, they could reconstruct um, enough DNA fragments or DNA sequences to fulfill the requirements of the US missing persons database um, genetic material requirements. So as you can imagine, that's become a fairly hot topic um, because that's an air sample. Water samples are probably even easier to track um, human uh, populations within. And so uh, as it becomes easier to both collect these samples, cheaper to sequence the DNA. And the key thing is easier to sequence long pieces of DNA that are needed for kind of individual or uh, human group identification. We need to be thinking really carefully about data collection and privacy uh, and just exactly what, what folks are doing as they're collecting gobs and gobs of DNA data, what could happen if that falls into the wrong hands? So I'm not going to focus too much on that, but I would uh, point you to this article as a really interesting uh, foray into, into that world that I think we're probably going to be hearing a fair bit more about um, in the future. Other recent news articles are that they were able to, to basically, uh, you may have heard, you know, that you can, in the permafrost, it's easy enough to find maybe a tusk of a mammoth or something like that, but we don't really have an idea of what the whole community was looking like when those mammoths were there in terms of the birds, the plants, there's a little rabbit right here. Um, and so what they were able to do from, I think, soil samples is extract DNA and use these, these techniques that allow you to recreate the whole community based on the DNA so that they could tell, you know, and sort of populate this very vivid picture of what, um, you know, life on earth looked like at that point in time. And then just another piece um, was this study that I think was sort of a precursor maybe to what, what the, the experiment that I mentioned for this, for this article was, 
where they basically had vacuums set up in a zoo and uh, concentrated air onto filters, extract DNA, and they could uh, basically from that air sample tell you what animals were in the zoo at that point in time. So pretty uh, quick moving technology with a lot of promise in the fields of uh, ecology and conservation, but perhaps an equal amount of worry uh, when it comes to human privacy and uh, nefarious uses. So um, just, I think it's worth, because I'm gonna be talking about eDNA data to just uh, do a quick overview of what kind of methods we're working with when we're using eDNA. So again, you're all, for this talk, I'm always gonna be talking about water samples. So the first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna be capturing that water on that filter. So the filter would be right here. All of the organisms except viruses are gonna be captured on that filter. The viruses and the water are gonna pass through. There are techniques to capture viruses. We can talk about that, but for our project, uh, it's just too difficult and it's too slow to filter water at the pore size needed for viruses uh, that we just say, we're gonna, we're okay missing that piece of biology, which the more we learn about viruses, the less good I feel about that statement because viruses are critically important uh, for bacteria and bacteria are critically important for the rest of life on earth. So um, yeah, but that's just, that's just where we have to start uh, at least. So then we'll take that filter, we're ex we'll extract the DNA. So that's extracting the genomic information. And that sample will have all of the DNA from everything that was in that sample. So it's gonna have that fish DNA. It's gonna have the, um, you know, the trees above the river DNA. It's gonna have the small macro invertebrates um, DNA and all of the algae and plankton. And so what we can then do with that is we can do meta barcoding, which is how you characterize the whole community or quantitative PCR, which is how you quantify one particular or a small suite of species. So for meta barcoding, you're basically taking the sample, amplifying all the DNA in it with a set of primers, which are sort of like um, molecular uh, kind of bookmarks that are gonna show you where in the genome you want to amplify. Um, and they're gonna do that across huge sections of the tree of life. So for example, we tend to have primers that will get all eukaryotic life. So that's everything um, that has a nucleus. We are eukaryotes. Uh, most things that you probably interact with on a day-to-day -day basis are eukaryotic. It's the and, uh, bacteria that are prokaryotic. So then we have a separate set of primers that will amplify bacteria. And then once we've amplified that, we do some fancy sequencing and bioinformatics. Currently, we're sequencing just a small fragment for this type of work. Um, so this is an example of where you would not have any issue with privacy because the size of the fragment that you're amplifying and looking at is not diagnostic to anything useful. It would just say, you have human. You don't have Robin Sleeth or art or any specific human. You just have human because that region is so conserved across all humans versus if you get more or longer regions, you can become more diagnostic. Then once we have that, we can start identifying species. And what we tend to do is use these stacked bar charts to talk about relative abundance so that you can say, there's uh, a lot more of this organism uh, at this time point or in this environment than any of these. This organism is unique to this uh, and you can do all sorts of statistics. Uh, and what's neat is you can kind of go back at this point to classical ecology where you have maybe a um, species matrix and then all of those sorts of, of techniques that were developed for census and survey plots um, are relevant again, because your observations are just DNA sequences rather than counting a, a tree in a forest. Um, 
So that's metabarcoding, which allows you to quantify, well, not quant, to um, characterize a whole community. Then you have quantitative PCR, which is going to be your, I think of it like a molecular tweezer. It's just going to go in and it's just going to pick out the one piece uh, from that whole DNA soup that corresponds to the organism that you're interested in. So for example, COVID, uh, we all are familiar with qPCR at this point because that's what that PCR test is, that's a really good way to understand what the level of COVID is in your system, right? So you're swabbing, you're doing a very quick extraction, uh, and then they're going to run that on a qPCR system, and they're going to be using primers that are looking for the sequence of the spike protein, I think it is. And so those primers are going to go in, they're going to amplify that, and because you're using primers that are specific to that, and you also use a set of standards of known concentration of that um, DNA piece that encodes the spike protein, then you're able to look and you're able to say, okay, well, your sample, Robin's sample, amplified at this cycle number between standard number four and standard number five. And because we know standard four and standard five concentration is sample, we can fit that to a curve um, and say exactly how much COVID is in that sample. So we're a little bit more familiar with quantitative PCR in the last few years than maybe before that. But the same thing that you do for COVID, you could do for great white shark, or you could do um, for, for basically any organism that's going to have DNA, you can go in and in the environment quantify exactly how much is there and compare across sites or compare across time or any other factor. Okay, so that's sort of a background. Um, the eDNA project has a lot going on that I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about today, but things from um, sustainable fisheries, I'll be focused on the harmful bloom side of things, but there's also uh, species on the move. So things like invasive species, and then this big macro system, once we have data from across all of these projects, how are we bringing that together to really learn about these coastal ecosystems? And so uh, the first kind of vignette or research piece that I'll share today uh, is focused on lakes, uh, cyanobacteria, and oysters. And so the um, harmful algal blooms, just a quick introduction, are when you have I don't love the term, but out of control growth of algae, harmful algal blooms, I would say in general, it's gonna be humans who designate what is a harmful algal bloom because it impacts us negatively in some way or we're able to measure a negative impact on some systems. So out of control can have a lot of different um, kind of meanings. It's not like there's an absolute number that works across all areas. And the impacts of harmful, harmful algal blooms uh, can be pretty wide spread. So they can impact commercial and recreational fisheries, aquaculture, tourism, wildlife, uh, human health. You've probably heard about the blooms in Lake Erie and uh, water supply issues when those blooms arise, or maybe the red tides uh, in places like Florida where you can get this cough just from breathing the air near one of these uh, toxic bloom events. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of folks from Canada uh, in the audience. And so there are certainly issues, of, especially around shellfish toxicity, um, and then also the Great Lakes, uh, where harmful algal blooms are, are likely something that you are more or less familiar with. And that uh, what I don't have on here Climate change is this, you know, ever present backdrop that is likely to exacerbate a lot of the factors that we already know are going to influence harmful algal blooms. And in addition to that, um, human activities. So, you know, the more we develop a lakefront, um, the more we pump, uh, you know, fertilizers into a watershed, those are things that are going to make these harmful algal blooms uh, a more tricky problem. So obviously there's a lot of effort on education, um, awareness, and kind of uh, best practices to minimize the impacts of these blooms. So 
the region that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, the first story is going to take place here in Midcoast, Maine, um, in the Damariscotta Lake and Damariscotta River region. So Damariscotta Lake is pictured here. Uh, it's a fairly large lake, 4,600 acres, 22 miles of shoreline. It's got a state park. Um, it has these three, this is the South Arm, that's one basin. The Skungus Bay is another, and then the North Basin up here. Uh, and another thing that's interesting about this lake is that uh, right here, it interfaces with the Damariscotta River estuary. This is called Great Salt Bay. And uh, you have a fish passage here for um, anadromous alewives. So similar to something like salmon, these alewives are spending part of their life out in the open ocean, and then they come back to freshwater to spawn. And so literally right now, there are thousands of alewives traveling from Great Salt Bay into Dramerscotta Lake. Um, and so that we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, potentially impacts the lake or um, what's going on in the lake is going to potentially impact the alewives. The other uh, piece about the Damariscotta Lake and Damariscotta River estuary are that once you get into the salt water, so the darker blue is salt water here, um, you have really important oyster aquaculture sites all up and down this river. And if you look at um, aquaculture oyster uh, harvest over time, you can see, first of all, that harvests have really increased recently. This is 2020. So this is this, these two data points are likely pandemic related, I would imagine that we're back on this sort of, you know, quite a rocket ship growth of, of oyster aquaculture. And we also know from number of people who are applying for aquaculture leases and all of those things that it is definitely increasing. So that's one piece, oyster aquaculture is increasing in Maine. The other piece is that the darker bars here are the Damariscotta River harvest, and then the violet here is everywhere else in the state. So you can see that the Damariscotta River alone is where the vast majority of oyster aquaculture for the state of Maine is coming from. So things that are happening in the Damariscotta Lake above the river, connected by that fish ladder and also a hydroelectric dam, um, are going to potentially impact this very important uh, aquaculture fishery. So what is the story of the, the harmful algal blooms on Damariscotta Lake? It starts in 2020 with a bloom of this species called Planktothrix. So this is a, a cyanobacteria. We used to call them blue-green algae. Uh, and so cyanobacteria are in the, the branch of the tree of life of bacteria, but they are able to uh, photosynthesize. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of what I would say bad press for cyanobacteria, but I can't uh, let folks forget that it was the incorporation of uh, cyanobacteria with a eukaryotic cell that led to the chloroplast in higher plants. So everything out there that you see that is green and photosynthesizing is that way because of this endosymbiotic event billions of years ago where a cyanobacteria was engulfed by a eukaryote and that became a stable endosymbiosis that has been maintained through time. So as much as we struggle with cyanobacteria in the harmful algal blooms side of things, we have them to thank for photosynthesis without which who knows what life on earth would look like. Uh, okay, so we had this bloom in 2020 um, with the species Planktothrix and uh, that was obviously right in the middle of the pandemic. So I hadn't even started on this project yet. And because of 
the pandemic, we weren't able to do much field work at this point, but we sort of said, okay, we've collected some baseline data. Let's take a real good look at what's going on in the lake uh, in the coming year. So these are the sorts of research questions that we wanted to ask where and what is blooming? Is it toxic? And are those cells moving downstream into the estuary? What sort of factors are promoting or inhibiting that bloom? Uh, this is sort of not, we don't need to go into the weeds on this, but this is what it takes to do kind of this eDNA approach where we want to quantify this particular species of cyanobacteria in the environment. So there's a lot of lab work. There's a lot of um, bioinformatic work that goes into designing those primers so that we can quantify exactly how much of the species is in the environment. But uh, we can, I'm happy to talk more about the details of that, but just to show you that that allows us to get figures like this, where we have the different sites that we're sampling in the lake across the season. This is going from the upper reaches of the lake down to the lower reaches of the lake. And then this is the fish ladder. So this is literally that interface with the, with the freshwater and the marine. Um, and so what we can see is that these cells are, are highest in about August and highest in the southern section of the lake. And when we see them in the lake, we are also seeing them coming out of the lake at the fish ladder. We measured just one set of cyanotoxins. So the other thing, the, the main reason, well, I guess not the main reason, there are two reasons that cyanobacteria are a threat to aquatic ecosystems. Number one is that explosive growth of anything can either shade out other species, compete for nutrients with other species, lead to anoxia once that means depletion of oxygen once they die and are being um, consumed. Uh, so that's that's one way that cyanobacteria could impact the environment. The other way is through these cyanotoxins, which are either directly toxic to human or toxic to other species uh, and will just impact the, the ecosystem in that way. So we did this specific toxin, uh, it's two toxins. Microcystin is probably the one that you've heard of if you've heard of any cyanotoxin because it's the one that's been most well characterized in terms of toxicity uh, and the one that we tend to kind of worry about the most even though there may be reasons to worry about other ones just as much. Um, but for this particular set of toxins, we did not detect anything above the thresholds set by either the World Health Organization or uh, the EPA. So that's somewhat good news that we have this bloom going on, but it doesn't appear to be toxic. So then a technique that we can um, use to kind of confirm and explore that a little bit more is that instead of taking, I actually lied to you because I said that eDNA were either metabarcoding something to characterize the community or we're doing qPCR to zoom in on one. There's a third option, which is metagenomics, which is going to sequence everything and all the DNA in a community. So this is the type that they're worried about for those, you know, privacy type issues because you're collecting a lot of data from a lot of markers. So a lot of markers being a lot of different DNA sequences um, from all the organisms in a sample. And so in this way, we can learn not just whether something is present, but what its whole genome is looking like. And so from that, we can see things like this is the biosynthetic pathway, right? So to make something like microcystin, you need to make proteins that are going to help build that molecule. And um, we, we know what those proteins are, and we know where they are in genomes of planktothrix. And these black bars here are the observations or the reads that we get when we do this metagenomic sequencing on our lake sample. And you can see that we have lots of coverage or lots of reads in nearby 
coding regions, but for the pathway that encodes microcystin, there's just nothing. This is, this is between two of those genes, so it picks it up again, but there's nothing there. So to me, this is telling me that we have a non-toxic genotype of plantothrix, which happens in cyanobacteria, that you can get toxic and non-toxic genotypes. There's a really active and interesting area of research trying to understand why you sometimes have a toxic strain and sometimes have a non-toxic and whether there's environmental um, factors that are influencing those sorts of things. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the conclusion. But for now, it looks like we have a non-toxic strain in Damariscotta Lake. So that is one silver lining. So then we wanted to expand sampling to understand movement downstream. Um, and so we added these uh, brackish sites at the fish ladder and further down the Damariscotta River estuary for 2022. But the first day that we went out on the lake in June 2022, we saw something completely different. This is another species of cyanobacteria called Dolichospermum that has this really coiled morphology. Uh, and it's actually a colony. Each, each dot in here is a cell and the cells are organized in filaments, and then the filaments are clumped together in these colonies, which means that you can just see this with the naked eye. This is a picture down at the surface of the water, and you can just see it looked like sort of if there's pollen suspended in the water or something like that, uh, but it was not. It was this cyanobacteria. So we go back to the lab and design primers or that, those molecular tweezers to quantify Dolichospermum in the environment. And when we do that, we see that this species, and we, we continued sampling throughout that summer, we saw that this species was highest early in the season, but present across all of the sites that we sampled in the lake, including just downstream in the fish ladder. But once you got into the estuary, we're recording very low levels. So, this first um, record is so high that I'm just going to drop it so that the scale comes up and we can compare everything else. But there is a very high um, measurement missing here. So you can see, again, we're measuring it clearly throughout the season and throughout the lake, but it does appear to decline over the growing season. Um, and you're, again, with the new scale, really not seeing much of anything at those estuary sites, but we are detecting it, which I think is interesting in and of itself. It's not truly zero. So then we get to July and we see the surface scum on the water and we say, this looks different. What's going on now? And we see that there are these straight filaments of a different type of dolichospermum now. And so we go back to the lab again, design another set of qPCR primers, and deploy those. And we see the opposite trend here where this species appears highest abundance latest in the season. So I wish we'd kept going. This was the end of September. Maine's starting to get a little bit cold at that point. And the partners who we rely on to get out on the lake had taken their boat out of the lake at that point. So we stopped sampling, um, but it turns out that last date that we went out was the highest we recorded for this species. So maybe we have sort of a spring blooming Dolichospermum and a fall blooming Dolichospermum. Again, we can do the metagenomic approach to look at the toxin pathways. And again, for a different species, right? Last time we were looking at Planktothrix, now we're looking at Dolichospermum. It's also missing the microcystin biosynthesis pathway. It's also missing the anatoxin. That's another cyanobacteria toxin um, biosynthesis pathway. So again, these appear to be non-toxic genotypes. Good news for the lake. Also, don't forget about Planktothrix. That did come back in uh, July, but it was restricted to one part of the lake, the South Basin. Um, but you can see, you know, I say we're downgrading this to nuisance bloom because from what we've seen, we're not quite sure that it's causing harm. If it doesn't have the toxins, it's not appearing at levels so great that it is, you know, shading out other organisms. So nuisance, uh, but that's still a big problem for a lake that relies on a huge summer tourism 
um, community. If you went to a lake that looked like this, it literally looks like blue green snot in the water. You probably would not want to go swimming. You might think twice about fishing. Um, so folks around the lake are still very much worried about this. So where does that leave us? Um, it's been interesting working on this lake because it was sort of, you know, once we started looking, we kept kind of peeling back layers and finding more interesting things going on. And from partners across the state, we're learning that this seems to be happening at lakes around the region. Uh, and so we do think that climate is likely playing a role. Maine historically has not had as many harmful algal bloom issues in freshwater, perhaps because of uh, you know, the temperature, a lot of the lakes are covered in ice for a good portion of the year. So that's limiting the growing season of, of potentially harmful species. Um, and you can look at ice out data. I should have included a slide of that, but it's very compelling when you look at how much earlier ice out is becoming across the state of Maine over the past 50 to 100 years. Uh, so things like that are bound to start changing the ecology, the biology in these lakes. The other thing that happened in 2022, we had a pretty significant um, drought. I think they even, our region got into the severe range for many days. Um, Dolichospermum is interesting in that it's able to fix atmospheric nitrogen. A lot of cyanobacteria have that ability. And so if you have a drought, you likely have less runoff because it's typically precipitation that's leading to runoff into water bodies. And that's typically bringing nitrogen into a system. So if you don't have that, perhaps nitrogen fixing species like Dolichospermum are able to thrive. Um, and that's why, you know, we hadn't seen that in previous years, we were seeing planktothrix, but then in 2022 with the drought, we saw that. However, I can tell you, we started going out on the lake in mid-May this year to try to get out there earlier to see the beginning of a spring dolichospermum bloom if we had one, and we did. So it seems like that spring bloom may be uh, a perennial bloom at this point. Um, and we're certainly gonna keep an eye on that. We're not seeing survival in brackish water. Some cells are detectable, uh, and we're doing experiments this summer to look at the salt tolerance of this species. Well, these multiple species. And then we were not able to characterize transport of microcystin because we weren't, these organisms aren't making microcystin. Um, so looking forward, we're, going to be incorporating nutrient and environmental data to build a model to understand if there are certain factors associated with these blooms, um, both their onset and as they're dissipating. Um, and then just another thing that keeps me up at night is that we have microcystin biosynthesis potential only 20 miles north of Damariscotta Lake. There's a lake, uh, China Lake, that has a dolichospermum strain that can make microcystin. So the question that I have, you know, it's inconceivable to me that since the last ice age, there hasn't been a chance for these things to move 20 miles around. You, it could be even move, you know, if it moved a dozen feet at a time on the legs of a water bird from one little pond or river to the next, it would get there. Um, so what is the ecology that's keeping that genotype out of Damariscotta Lake? And, uh, you know, someone at the state has a theory that if you get recurring blooms, they start off non-toxic and then a toxic genotype gets in there and is a, a better competitor. And that's when you start getting the toxic blooms. So hopefully that is not going to happen. And also hopefully we can take some steps to mitigate uh, before we get that. And then for 2023, our summer students actually just started Monday. Um, and what they're going to be doing is 
We're sampling oysters just uh, in that great salt bay just south of the fish ladder uh, to look at microcystin and anabenopeptin. We don't think microcystin is being produced, but we just want to monitor it for baseline. We do know from the genomics that anabenopeptin is likely being produced. So that's kind of a, an analog that we can use. It's toxic in and out of itself, but um, if folks are more worried about microcystin, these are likely to behave similar in oyster tissues. So we can use that to say, you know, look, if we get a bloom of this magnitude, how toxic are those oysters going to be? Um, and the, the reason that we're worried about oysters and cyanotoxins, um, this is sort of the first story back in 2010 that really put this on a lot of folks' radar was in California where they had sea otter deaths and they, through a bunch of kind of forensic veterinary science, were able to link the death of these sea otters to shellfish that was contaminated with freshwater cyanotoxins. So you had a bloom of microcystis, that's another species of cyanobacteria in freshwater close to Monterey Bay. You had transport of that bloom water into the bay. You had oysters and mussels and things growing in the bay that then are bioaccumulating the microcystin, whether they're filter feeding the microcystis itself or just water that has a lot of microcystin in it. Um, and they're able to measure those shellfish and see that the concentrations are 107 times higher. So that's that bioaccumulation as you're filter feeding. That's what makes shellfish such a tricky problem for harmful algal blooms. As you're filter feeding, you are amplifying whatever's in the water into your tissues. So then if you have otters consuming those, they would go into liver failure. And unfortunately, several otters did die from this. So we know that the potential is there where you have a freshwater bloom going into a marine system and amplifying in oysters. In this case, we don't have river, I'm sorry, we don't have sea otters, but we would have humans consuming <laughs> shellfish from the Damariscotta uh, River estuary. So reason to, to really keep an eye on this issue. So I'm gonna take a quick sip of water and then we'll get started with the next story. So I'm gonna share <clears throat> work that was done uh, primarily by a graduate student who we work with, Sharon Mann, uh, who is actually in not the harmful algal bloom side of the main eDNA project, but the sustainable fisheries side. Um, because she works on alewives and the link between alewives and their uh, freshwater systems and health in those systems. And so now we're gonna be moving <clears throat> a little bit further down the coast in Maine to Highland Lake. So Portland, this is Casco Bay right here. You've got Portland right in here. Um, so just inland from Portland is Highland Lake, but connected by river systems to Casco Bay. And because you're in kind of metro Portland suburban area here, you've got a highly developed shoreline for this lake. It has had um, problems with um, water clarity and algal blooms uh, going back to 1998. But a very active lake association that's tried to turn the lake around and uh, been fairly successful increasing water quality in this lake. Uh, but then they also wanted to restore, there's a lot of activity across Maine focused on restoring alewife, historic alewife passages. So when um, Europeans first came to Maine, there was a lot of damming of rivers associated with that early, uh, early development that closed off a lot of rivers and lakes for anadromous fish. We've since realized the harm in that and have really 
started to uh, look at either fish passages, so fish ladders and other methods, or removal of dams altogether to restore connectivity between these freshwater and marine systems so that anadromous fish, which are keystone uh, in a lot of these systems, can return and we can, you know, try to try to do the best work that we can to restore these ecosystems. So they did a huge restoration of their fish passage. And then the first four years when those alewives returned, they had algae blooms. And so correlation would say, well, we fixed our fish passage and now we get algae blooms. The alewives are causing the blooms, but it is not that simple. And so we're gonna look at where this whole uh, debate is and uh, try to shed some light on what's going on with this algae bloom uh, and yeah, just share some of the work that Sharon has done. So really quick, <clears throat> um, alewives are going to return to, so this is fresh water here to spawn. So those eggs are gonna um, develop Larvae are going to come, grow up in the freshwater, move into estuaries in the fall, and then move into uh, the ocean for fall and winter, continue to grow, and then return. And unlike salmon or some salmon and other species, um, this is happening throughout the lifetime. So they're not dying when they go to their uh, spawning grounds you have uh, the adults leaving shortly after spawning. Um, so it's a, just a little, that becomes important when you're thinking about nutrients coming in and leaving a system. So thinking about what could possibly be causing this bloom in Highland Lake, you've got potential of excess nutrients. That's typically one of the first things we look at but that's unlikely. Uh, phosphorus levels were lower um, than those typically associated with nuisance blooms, perhaps an unusual phytoplankton species. Uh, at first, people were thinking that this could be a, a picocyanobacteria, so very small size cyanobacteria, which we'll talk more about, or perhaps a trophic cascade. So this is this idea that the alewives are consuming a link in the food web. And by consuming that link, you're releasing grazing pressure from some algae, and then the algae could grow up to levels that could cause a bloom. So we'll look at that in a little bit more detail here. Um, so in this food web, you have your fish that eat fish at the top. Then you have your fish that eat plankton, like alewife here. So here's your zooplankton. Um, and then you have also these uh, predatory larvae and rotifers. And um, these are indicating that there is consumption in this direction as well. And so what happens um, is that if you were to take out this link, you would have less grazing on these guys. These guys are the ones who are really grazing these cyanobacteria single cell and colonial algae. And by removing that link, um, that's releasing these and allowing them to grow more prolifically. So we need to look at that and we need to understand how many juvenile alewife there are, just what they're eating, and then also know the background uh, nutrients for this system and what role this sort of middle piece of the food web is playing. So those are all of the things that Sharon is looking at for her dissertation. And so why do we need to use eDNA for this? Well, for the microscopy that's done, that has been done looking at this bloom, we know it's in this pico to nano size range. Um, so a human hair is probably somewhere here on this scale at about 100 micrometers to 200. Um, we're talking about organisms that 
are very small and very difficult to identify even with a powerful microscope because they tend to look like little green balls or LGB. And so what a lot of people note if they're doing plankton counts, they'll say, you know, and this percentage of little green balls, because I don't have the ability to distinguish this one from this one. But because these all have DNA and the DNA is going to be unique to a species, we can use eDNA to understand those patterns. And that's what we did. So in the previous uh, research uh, that I was talking about, we were using a lot of qPCR. Now we're looking at metabarcoding data. So this is the type of data that allows you to characterize all the organisms in a given community by looking at a single barcode that's common across all of those organisms. And so what you have is the date on the x-axis, and then you've got these stacked, stacked bar plots. So this is the relative abundance of organisms by sampling date. And this is for the epilimnion or the upper level of the lake. And so what you can see, they know from work out on the lake where they use a Secchi disk, which basically measures water transparency, that the, the lowest value of that, so the, the worst water transparency they were able to measure was around this date in mid-July. And on that date, you can see that there is a big green bar here. And that green corresponds to Archaeplastida, which is the group that includes green algae and plants. And when each of these smaller bars or, or dashes here um, are lineages within that group. And so you can see because there are no dividing bars here, this is all one organism that's responsible for this big chunk of this sample. And when we look at that sequence, it comes back as Rexanema, which was formerly known as Helicodictian, which is a weirdo species of green algae that we had not really heard very much about. You can do the same thing. So like I said, we look at eukaryotes and prokaryotes or bacteria. Those are the two ways that we can do the metabarcoding. When we look at bacteria, including cyanobacteria, we see no clear trend of something changing on that bloom day. So this is immediately to me a bit of a smoking gun that it looks like there's something funky going on and that it's a green algae on that bloom day that corresponds to the Secchi depth. And so the met problem with metabarcoding is that it's not quantitative. We can't say exactly how much of this is at this time. We can just say there's a higher proportion on this day than on this day. So we wanted to get quantitative and design some qPCR assays. So when we do that and we measure rexanema over time via the quantitative method, we can see that that spike corresponds to not only a spike in chlorophyll, but also the drop in Secchi clarity. So again, this makes me feel very confident that what's responsible for the loss of water clarity is the species of green algae. So you Robin, can... if, uh, if I could just sort of advise you that uh, you've got about five minutes left uh, for wrapping up. Perfect, thank you. Um, if you look at the cyanobacteria, you can see that the trend in cyanobacteria abundance does not correspond to Secchi disk. So um, the same thing that happened in 2018 happened to a much lower extent in 2019 and 2021. We do see some rexanema, but not nearly as abundant. This is a saying that we have about harmful algal blooms that as soon as you start studying them, they go away. And that seems to be the case for this one. So stay tuned. Um, the next kind of steps that we're gonna take are to culture this species. Um, we, I think we have it in culture at this point, so we can do some experiments with it um, and you know, confirm that DNA identity from the metabarcoding. Uh, and then send that also to an expert taxonomist because everyone who we talk to, we say, we found rexanema and it's this bloom forming. They're like, rexanema, that doesn't cause blooms. And they're scratching their heads. So got to dot our I's and cross our T's.
Um, and then the other thing that Sharon is really interested in looking at are looking across the food web. So these are some of those grazers that would have occupied that middle part of the food web um, to see if the dynamics of the grazers are linked with this bloom and connect this all back to the trophic um, cascade with the alewives. So that is still work in progress. Um, and I'm very excited to see what happens with that project to see if we can link uh, increased alewives abundance and grazing to shifts at other trophic levels. Um, the state of Maine obviously is very interested in in this debate of our our alewives causing water quality issues, and they've done studies on other water bodies that have had historically, you know, pre um, European settlement, lots of alewives, and then the alewives were wiped out because of a dam and then reintroduced, and they see no water quality issues. So there are um, there are certainly many examples where you have the reintroduction of alewives with no, no issue. So uh, it could be something completely different that's responsible for this, but nevertheless worth kind of digging into and doing the, the science that's needed to really inform this, uh, this issue. So with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge my postdoc advisor, Pete Countway, who, uh, you know, has been really supportive and uh, able to, to keep a lot of this work going. Um, and then the great students that I've been able to work with uh, from both Colby College and Bates, and then Sharon Mann, who's a PhD student whose work I was just referencing. Uh, and so with that, I would be happy to take questions um, and I can stop my share if that would be best at this point, but I will wait for you all to let me know. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was very interesting. I feel as if, I, as if I've been sitting in a classroom learning an awful lot of stuff that I had no clue about. But uh, one of the things that I was interested in is the relationship of uh, soil-based agriculture and the use of uh, herbicides and pesticides and their migration into the waterways and whether the known impacts of these things to uh, edible crops is also harmful to the marine species that you're uh, that you've been talking about yeah that's a, an interesting question um there there certainly is there's no question that if you are applying pesticides and fertilizers close to the coast that those are going to find their way into coastal waters um and i i this isn't an area that i'm quite familiar with but I would think that proven impacts on either terrestrial or freshwater organisms would be similar in the marine system, right? It, it's not like all of a sudden that pesticide gets into the marine system and all of a sudden, you know, it's not going to impact anything when we see that it's greatly impacting zooplankton and freshwater or something like that. Um, so yeah, I think we're learning a lot more about the interface between freshwater and, uh, and saltwater ecosystems. A lot of the areas when I sort of think about where these problems really come to a head are in large estuary type settings. So like the Chesapeake Bay and things like that, where you have a, a large land area with a large history of, of land use and agriculture, and you don't have the tidal flushing that we necessarily have in Maine. So one of the advantages that Maine has going for it, for example, in the Damariscotta River system, we're not 
super worried about those cyanotoxins coming down and spending months and months in that system because that system gets flushed out so thoroughly by the, you know, eight foot tides, or I'm not entirely sure what it is, but there's so much tidal movement that that's really helping to dilute. So there's that terrible saying that the solution to pollution is dilution. Um, and there is, you know, something to be said of that if you're getting a ton of tidal movement in that's flushing that whole system. Whereas somewhere perhaps like the Chesapeake and some of these more lowland areas, you're not getting these really high tide movements and you're not getting that flushing. And so those are the places where the impacts of land use, I think, can be a lot more, they're felt a lot more strongly, if that makes sense. Okay, well, thank you. I was uh, trying to get in touch with uh, Peter McKinnon so that he could ask his question. Peter, if you could turn on your mic and your video, and then up next is going to be Peter Volkowski. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I seem to have a video problem, but I can get, uh, yeah, my, my camera is not working. Sorry. Uh, can I, I can ask my question, though, I guess. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Robin, for a very interesting and as as uh, as Phil said, learning learning a lot of, in areas that are beyond my normal uh, preview. So um, I was just wondering, um, do limnology cores show any evidence of past blooms, and can one determine if they were toxic events? And if so, is there any temporal pattern over the history of the core? Great question. Uh, we actually are collaborating on a USDA project right now that's looking at that in Maine Lakes uh, for cyanobacteria blooms in cores. Um, so the first part of can you detect these blooms in cores, I would say, yes, we, we know that. Um, this is a place where eDNA and also uh, isotopes and um, a, a lot of those sort of sediment core type place type science really, really shine um, that you're able to very clearly see, perhaps not even through the cyanobacteria themselves. A lot of times you end up using the diatom record because diatoms do such a good job of preserving. And we know that certain diatoms, they're also uh, excellent indicators of environmental conditions. So there are certain diatom species that are going to thrive when you have higher nutrient regime. And there's certain diatoms that are going to thrive when you have a certain size class of zooplankton, all those sorts of things. So you can kind of use those as your, uh, your indicator to look back at time to reconstruct environmental conditions in addition to being able to directly detect cyanobacteria the cells of cyanobacteria are not going to preserve as well as a diatom but what we're finding is that the dna is is still there and still in a to a certain time back uh still in a in a uh a state that we can get some information out of it. So um, yeah, that that's super interesting and super helpful for things like the Rexanema bloom to say like, did this, is it an invasive species? Did this thing get introduced to Highland Lake? And that's why it's acting so strange. Mm -hmm. If we go back in a core and we see that Rexanema has not been detected in the last 50 years, then it would really, you know, that would tell me it seems like it's an introduced species. Likewise, as you say, you can use it to learn a lot about the history of cyanoblooms, the history of toxins, and that will help a lot to know the impact of climate, right? We've gone through climate fluctuations in the past, so we can use those to learn about what might be happening in the future, although the speed and current situation is fairly unprecedented, so it will be somewhat helpful, but perhaps not as helpful. Well, a couple, couple of, I may, just one more question that related. Um, given what you've just said, uh, can you use radioisotopes for the dating 
Yep. Uh, and then also use, uh, say, oxygen isotopes uh, for temperature uh, patterns and so on. Absolutely. Yeah. So that all of that sediment core work, I find super neat because they're able to, it, yeah, to just get pretty darn precise between the diatom record, the isotope record, and um, uh, yeah, all of those, all of those. And what what typically are the, the length of time in your cores? That's my last question. Um, I think for this US, I'm sorry, did I, if I said USDA, that I misspoke, it's USGS. For this USGS project, um, I think it's on the range of a, 150 to 200 really what what we're what's useful to us a lot of times is getting like pre-european settlement data yeah. um and that's that's as far back as we feel like we need to go though i think there are examples of being able to go much further like that you know that edna paper that i pointed to from the news that is going back you know, thousands and thousands of years, but I, that, that was a lot of work. You can't do that for a lot of sites. They had to get lucky with the preservation of those samples and things like that. Well, I've been involved in ice core uh, work in the high Arctic, and we've done pollen analysis of those of the cores. And we find pollen comes from Central America in pulses over time. And they seem to be related to the large ch changes in general circulation. And our records go back about a quarter million years. So it may tie into some of your limnology records and maybe some interesting comparisons possible in the literature and then the data. Yeah, thanks. Well, we'll okay, well, thanks. Peter Volkowski, I sent you a message to turn on your mic and your video. Are you ready to ask your question? Mike's and then on. Uh, Walter Knittel has a technology question. My mic's on, I don't have video. Uh, Robin, thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, George Orwell would have to rewrite 1984 with this technology and others that we have. Uh, my questions are related to the toxic versus non-toxic cyanobacteria. Uh, is a non-toxic cyanobacteria able to mutate into a toxic one? And if you had a lake or an environment where there were toxic cyanobacteria, if you seeded that lake with non-toxic cyanobacteria, would they survive or would the toxic cyanobacteria always outcompete the non-toxics? Yeah, so I mean, you're basically summing up the, the hot topics of the day and what, what we really want to understand. Uh, in terms of the mutating, it would take a lot of time for typical mutation rates to get to a point of, you know, biosynthesis of this compound on its own. The thing that I worry more about are these horizontal gene transfer events. And that tends to happen when you have viruses. You can have viruses um, that will start to... I, I don't understand the full details of it, but basically they can either themselves or through just the machinery of the virus working, get genetic material from one strain of bacteria to another strain of bacteria. Um, and so, or just through recombination, I don't, I don't know exactly what conditions you need for all of the different types of horizontal gene transfer, but um, that exists. And so that for certain, given enough time would likely happen between these toxic and non-toxic strains to move that around. So either you'll get the toxic one itself, or you'll get the transfer of that. Um, and those are things that as we gather more genomic data, we're going to be really interested in to look at. And one, one additional piece on that are these plasmids. So bacterial genomes will sometimes have a plasmid, which is a smaller um, other circular piece of DNA. And the plasmids are much more mobile and can be moved from strain to strain, between strains, things like that. Uh, and there is evidence of 
toxin biosynthesis genes on a plasmid for, for one of these groups of cyanobacteria. And so in that case, that seems like it's like it's ready and kind of has evolved to move those toxic genes around in nature, which is a little bit scary to think about. Um, but yes, I think those dynamics are certainly in play. And then in terms of if you could kind of seed the non-toxic into a toxic, I, I just tend to think producing toxins is expensive, energetically expensive, I believe. And if you, I, I'm just not sure, I, my gut is saying that the toxic genotype is just going to be at a competitive advantage because for it to spend that energy, it's not spending that energy for no reason. Um, but those experiments absolutely should and likely are being done. Um, but I, yeah, I'll have to follow up, but absolutely. Thank you again for a very interesting presentation. Have yourself a great day. Thanks. Okay, so Walter, go ahead. And then uh, Richard Vanderzeg, you're on deck. Um, that's great. Um, thanks for the presentation. Some of it sunk in, though I should have paid more attention to biology class way back when. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm curious about uh, what type of digital technologies you use in sampling and monitoring like for example, connected sensors and, and the like, and also how much, if any of that analysis done in, in situ rather than bringing it back to the lab or what's the kind of a ratio of that? Yeah, so um, the only in situ measurements that we do are using uh, a YSI sond, um, I think it's the why is that short for Yellow Springs Incorporated? Maybe they're one of the big water testing um, device companies, and so we have a sound that will measure uh, probably about fifteen parameters. So things like temperature, salinity. It has a chlorophyll sensor. It has a phycocyanin sensor. So those those are going to sense pigment concentrations in the col in the water column as a proxy for cell density um, and then dissolved oxygen pH. Um, so that is giving us a real time bit of information. Uh, and then everything else is coming back to the lab. So we're collecting water samples for nutrients and then doing um, nutrient analysis. We actually pass that off to another lab that actually is running the nutrient analyzing machines, uh, bringing water back for the DNA, of course, and then bringing water back for the toxin analysis. There is a ton of research and technology development happening to try to get more real-time sensors of things like cyanotoxins, because the closer we can get to real-time, the better places, especially like Toledo and things like that, that their entire city water supply needs to shift when they've got a bloom of these things. And the faster they can know, and the more real-time they can know the levels of these toxins, you know, it's better. Uh, so yeah, there's there's some really exciting stuff out there. A lot of it is is the, these sort of like biosensors seem to be a lot of the way the that people are are looking to sense some of these cyanotoxin molecules because you can design a biological kind of um, grasp for those and then have some way to to quantify off of that. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, if I could just do a, a short follow on. So in terms of the actual sampling, is it done manually? Like, part of my ignorant in flask, or is there some other automated way of to, so, like geolocating the, the samples? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we will go out on the boat and then the, the piece that I didn't mention is we use a Niskin bottle. So that's a water sampling device that allows you to collect water from a discrete depth. 
So it has, this one is about five liters. So it's pretty big and it's got the spring loaded mechanism. You lower that, we typically collect at a meter depth because there's some weird stuff that goes on right at the surface. So you lower this big bottle down with these spring loaded ends down to a meter, drop a messenger down and then that snaps shut. So you've got water from a meter. So that is standardizing kind of our water collection across all of these, but um, otherwise it's fairly low tech. You know, we're driving the boat out to the GPS coordinate on, on our, um, you know, plotting software and dropping anchor and collecting those. Great, thank you. Okay, so Richard, and uh, then I guess it's Dave that has a question after that. Okay, thanks, Robin. That that was a great, it was a really interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm just wondering how much of your findings actually get, are used to influence policy or regulations and so forth? And, or are you planning to go that direction or have, have you already done that? In, because if you see some of these trends and you're worried about toxins and mergings and so I just wonder if, if you're going in that direction. Yes. Um, and these would be, the parts where maybe I can speak more freely when the recorded section <laughs> ends. Um, but yeah, we certainly do our best. We have some great state partners that we work with, the main DEP in particular. They're, you know, they're as equally a little bit caught off guard by this cyanobacteria problem. Um, and are, are looking for best practices and are looking for uh, science to fill that in. So yeah, we absolutely at the state level um, have them in regular meetings. And then um, the EPA is also really interested in cyanoblooms as well. So I would say, you know, at that level, it's sort of like the, the environmental organizations of government, absolutely. Um, but then you still have problems where even if your environmental organization knows or is saying that you should be doing one thing, that doesn't always go up further. Okay, so Dave, and then uh... Peter Volkowski and Peter McKinnon, are you still around and do you want to ask secondary questions? Go ahead, Dave. Hi, Robin. Uh, I wonder if you could give us an idea of whether the extension of the ice-free season on freshwater lakes in Maine, which is already at about three to four weeks from my personal experience up on Moosehead Lake, um, might affect the uh, algal plankton and uh, how that would likely change the makeup and, and perhaps even the kinds of chemicals that they produce as climate change intensifies. Yeah, so I mean, I think the growing season is probably the biggest factor. If, if you asked me what, why are we getting blooms on Damariscotta Lake year after year where in the early 2000s, we were not seeing this type of thing. And I would say, I think it's earlier ice out, longer growing season for these algae, warmer temperatures when it is the growing season, but just having those three to four additional weeks to get started mean that your communities are, are just at a much, uh, you know, higher level. Um, but I think you also, in some of these places have to keep in mind what's happening in the watershed as well. So as we are having these earlier ice outs, we're probably in a lot of watersheds also having increased development. There's a, a ton of second home uh, activity on lakes in Maine and that, I don't know if that has slowed down. Uh, and so, yeah, you have to kind of keep all of those things in mind in terms of the growing season impacting the toxin potential, all of that. I, I think it's all on the table. Absolutely. Um, more time to get up to funny business, I guess I would say. So uh, more complications in the grand uncontrolled experiment we're running. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, Peter Wilkowski, are you still around? I'm still here. I just unmuted. Uh, okay. you, you answered both of the, my original questions, but I've got one other technical question uh, for you, Robin. You sample at one meter depth. Have you done any uh, depth profiling? Yeah, so I said I said the one meter because that's what we do typically. That's even not fully the case. That's what we do most often. But when we're really doing our lake um, assessments, we'll do what's called an epicore. And so that's doing a, it's like a P, what is the material? It's not, it's like flexible PVC tubing with a weight. <clears throat> and so you'll drop that down. You'll measure where the, when we do our YSI profiling, we'll get a whole depth profile to understand what's going on with the, um, particularly temperature and dissolved oxygen, right? That's how you know your lake is stratified and where that bolymnion is, the, um, you know, the thermocline, all of those classic limnological, limnological um, levels of a lake. And so we'll do the epi core, which is going to capture kind of a core of water all the way down to the thermocline, um, stopping before it gets to the thermocline so that we can integrate the biology in that epilimnion. Um, if we know and we notice something about the dissolved oxygen, then we may take a sample like a meter from the bottom if we notice that like it's gone anoxic, which can happen, right? As you get down to the bottom, the bacterial activity uh, on the bottom of a lake can often lead to depletion of, of oxygen close to the bottom. Um, so yeah, and when when we do nutrient sampling, the standard nutrient sampling is an epicore and a surface grab and a bottom grab a meter off the bottom so that you can get that whole lake profile because that ends up telling you a lot about what's going on in a lake. You kind of have to know what's going on at each of the levels. So yeah, thank you for reminding me to point that out. Ter terrific, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, if I could squeeze in a, a, one other thing, when you get near the bottom, are any of your areas sufficiently anoxic that you're picking up SRB, sulfate reducing bacteria or not? Uh, well, Dave Emerson here at Bigelow would be the person to talk to that um, a little bit better than I am. We honestly, you know, we're focused on our cyanos and we're looking at that in the beta barcoding data. I haven't dug into the meta barcoding for bottom samples to look for those in particular, but I, I do think some of the sites that we go to in Maine are anoxic for such a long period of time that you would get, you'd get those guys. There's, yeah. Okay, again, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks. Okay, Peter McKinnon. And then Paul Beckwith. And we have about five minutes left. So just if we can uh, do shorter questions and shorter answers, that would be great. Thank you, Phil. Apologize, my camera's still not working. Um, so I just had a comment and then a question that uh, follows from it. And it was uh, very early in your presentation, Robin. Um, and uh, I just made the comment, we have had bioethics now for a number of decades. And uh, my question is, why do some researchers appear to go beyond the limits of bioethics? Any comment? <laughs> and this actually triggered a discussion among some of the participants in the uh, listening to your webinar. <laughs> in terms of, of... Well, it, it just it struck me one of the comments you made early in your presentation triggered me on the issue of bioethics. And th so yeah. I just wondered, is this an issue in your field? Are, are many people, uh, are you using a bioethics protocol, for example? Yeah, so I guess in the eDNA world, I would say we're still, it's still so new that the ethical framework just isn't there, right? I would imagine that in the next mm -hmm. few years, there will be standard practice that when you get your metagenomic sequencing back, you upload it to a database that's, you know, a protected kind of, in the US, we have HIPAA, which is like yeah. your health yeah. care related yeah. things. 
and it's going to go and it's going to pull all of the human data out of that and hold it. And then you're going to get everything that wasn't human out of that. We're just not there yet. So, I mean, I agree with you. It's, it's up to individuals. Um, I personally have not seen any misuse or heard of any misuse of genetic data for people in the fields that I'm familiar with. I will say um, we do certainly get pushback from certain community groups if we approach and we say, hey, we'd love to come in and help you address this issue that you're having and we think eDNA could be a great way to do it. There are some groups who say, we don't want you sampling eDNA from our water. You could be collecting human DNA or learning things about us that we do not feel comfortable. So in terms of stakeholders, absolutely. There are concerns. And I think that that's because the ethical framework is not there yet. Once we have those uh, sort of guidelines, then we can say, look, we're following the, you know, yeah. Toronto protocol or something like yeah. that that sets out all of these things. And then those groups would say, oh, well, you know, that seems to be a fair enough way of dealing with these issues, but we're just not there yet. Got it, thank you. Okay, Paul, and then uh, Jean, you can do your thank you. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, very fascinating uh, studies and talk. Um, the, I guess, can you comment a little bit on water temperatures um, as a result of increasing as a result of climate change um, in Maine lakes. Um, but also, I think the um, water temperatures have significantly increased um, off the coastlines of Maine, um, probably partly attributed to slowing down of the uh, Gulf Stream. So it's sweeping over the continental shelves more. And so, so it's increasing water temperatures affecting all of these things significantly, I would say. So have, have you done measurements over time or have you looked at the climate data on, on water temperatures of both the, the lakes, the freshwater, and also the, the oceans? Off the I'll coast? start with the coast because that's what I am more familiar with kind of recently. So we, um, we work somewhat with a group that's looking at kelp forests across the Gulf of Maine. And they show these figures of, well, they call them marine heat waves. So they're looking at like the number of, I forget what the metrics are, but it's basically number of days above a certain temperature that they think are really a problem for these kelp forests. And it's one of the most convincing graphs that I've seen of just how much warmer the gulf has in even the last 10 years how rapidly that is increasing um, and they they're seeing the impacts of that there used to be kelp forests down south of casco bay those are now degraded slash gone and kelp forests the healthy kelp forests are still um you know restricted to the down east parts of Maine. So the marine in the marine setting, absolutely pretty troublesome how quickly that that warming is happening. Um, and there's a lot of interesting data and discussion on that um, that you can find um, yeah. in the literature. For the lakes, it's a little bit trickier um, just because you're dealing with such a latitudinal variation. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the coastal area is warming most rapidly and the lakes within the coastal region are warming most rapidly. Um, but I'm, I'm not as well versed on across Maine what's going on because it's just, it's kind of in every direction depending where yeah. you are. Uh, but I know yeah. that people are very concerned about high altitude lakes in particular, because I think those are sort of the early, early warnings of of things changing. Um, so I think it's the coastal and maybe the high altitude lakes that are the most compelling evidence at this point. And also sea level rise um, off Maine is is the highest just about anywhere in the US. Like it's over 10, 11 millimeters per year in some regions for a variety of re reasons. But I think what the biggest one is probably, you know, the ocean warming on the continental shelf. 
but also the Gulf Stream flowing and and pushing more water onto the shelf. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jean. Um, thank you very much, uh, Phil and Robin. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, it is my pleasure to thank you on behalf of KCOR and um, just for giving this, this talk. It's been a long time since we've had one that is quite so scientific rather than technical and, and uh, in, in, its, in its scope. So this was a real delight for me in particular, going back a long, a long time into my background as a biologist. Anyway, I would really like to thank you for this particular talk and, um, and all the information that you've been able to impart to us on something that we really haven't had a chance to hear very much about. So thank you very much for that. Well, thank you folks for your time. And with that, I would like to um, say to everyone here and those who listen to this later on, um, I, I go to our website, CanadianCore.com, to find the information and links to this particular talk and other talks that we will that we have had in the past. And you will have a chance to look at, at the uh, information in our video page and find information on other talks that we have had. It's, it's a wonderful resource for people. Um, if you log into our Stay Informed and sign up for our Stay Informed page, you will get those automatically sent to your email box once a week for all of the all of the things that have happened in the last week or so from our particular website. If you're interested in finding out more information about the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome, you can find that on our website, how to become a member, and also if you would like to donate to us that would also be part of our website. So with that, I would like to thank you all for coming and thank you again, Robin, for a wonderful talk.